Welcome to Midpoint, OCC's midweek podcast aimed at helping you connect with last week's message and prepare you for next week's sermon. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to Midpoint, your midweek connection to Orchards Community Church. Last weekend, James talked through the easy passage of replacing <laughs> Judas in Acts 1, 12 through 26. Easy. Easy, easy. Now, truly all jokes aside, I, I lead in that way because this passage, a lot of us can get stuck on, uh, myself including because we had a conversation about this. We actually had a question this week um, that there was some hesitation to ask, so I'm going to ask it. <laughs> um, I will take it on myself uh, on their behalf. So I totally agree that from all indications, um, there's just a lot of things that point that that Judas didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah during his ministry. Um, but the question is, is I wonder about Matthew 27, 3 through 5, um, which is where um, Judas kind of has some some guilt or or uh, and returns the money or tries what, to return What looks the money. like remorse, yeah. Yes. There, there you go. Thank you. Um, do you think there's a chance that Judas's repentance over his greed, um, and, and repentance, uh, uh, maybe the, the key word there, whether it was actual repentance, but yeah. over his greed and his betrayal of innocent blood could have extended to believing in Jesus? Or was he just feeling guilty? I know the, the Bible has a lot of very negative things to say about Jesus's betrayer, but is it possible even he could have been saved at the last? Yeah. I think it's a great question, and I think it's the question we ask because we're hopeful. Mm-hmm. We, we don't want to see... Well, I mean, sadly, we're also sinful, and there are, some, <laughs> there are some people we probably don't want to be in heaven, and that's on us. But but in general, yeah, we're hopeful. Hey, God can save anybody. He'll, he, he determines that. And, and then you see Judas do that act of going to return the money, which was huge for him when you think about how important money was to him. And so there was. Now, you know, the question you have to ask is, is that guilt... Is that a guilty conscience, or, or was that true repentance? And and the only thing you can do, I mean, I think the wise thing to do every time is correlate the rest of Scripture mm-hmm. and say, okay, what else do we see? So I'm not just basing it on this one passage. And and we had a, a, another question submitted, and it was great, and thank you so much. There were several great questions submitted this week. But it was, you know, dealing with the, the process of Judas being replaced, because the reality is he's the only disciple who is replaced. Mm-hmm. And as they go, as they're obedient on this mission to go out and be witnesses, all the guys, according to church history, wind up being martyred. James, very early on in the process, and you don't see the disciples then reconvening and replacing James. How come Judas got replaced and none of the other disciples get replaced? And I think, honestly, this kind of leads into this notion that those guys have a role that we may not fully understand where they are sitting on the thrones, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and Revelation talks about the throne room, and, and, and those guys are there. And, and so James didn't have to be replaced because once he leaves his earthly ministry, he's going to do that heavenly ministry. Judas was not going to do that. Judas had to be replaced. Why? Because he's not going to heaven. And so that's mm-hmm. how you start tying those things together. And, and again, I mean, thankfully God's sovereign over all that. You start to feel bad. You do look at Judas's case and, and go, here's a guy who was not uh, all in. He, he did go along with these guys for three years, but clearly he was not sold out to Jesus as these other guys were. And I think that makes us think a lot about how we're walking through our lives on this earth. Because yeah. there are a lot of people who do. I mean, I've met people who go to church regularly and who live pretty decent lives and, and they're not, you know, bank robbers and, and they don't even cuss that much or drink that much, but they've never professed faith in Christ. And those people are good enough people here on earth, but this really doesn't count. <laughs> Everything's about our eternity. And so I, I appreciate the question so much. I, I think as you correlate the big picture of scripture, I think it makes a pretty solid case that Judas is not yep. there. And that's what we have to rely on. Yeah. And, and again, that, that's where I'm always going to go, because yep. otherwise I'll, I'll paint myself into corners because my comprehension is, is limited. My uh, my feelings will start to weigh in on things. I'd love to see Judas be saved. I think because he was replaced, officially replaced as an apostle, then yes, that means that he is not a believer. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Still a great question. Yep. Yeah, and the guilt, you just don't know where it came from. Yep. I mean, he probably just lost 11 friends yeah. um, that he had spent three years of his life with. 
Uh, and, and and you just wonder again. I mean, those other guys don't see hearts the way Jesus does. But I, 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 there's a neat, neat um, corollary to this. And I was thinking about this because it, in the book of Job, if you remember Job's story, and, and it's, gosh, it just uh, applies in so many other areas in our lives. But Job at the beginning had you know rich uh, riches. He had a ton of cattle. He had a ton of oxen and all that stuff. And he was hugely blessed. He had ten kids. Remember, it said he had seven sons and three daughters. And and at the end of his journey, after 42 chapters of his journey, he gets blessed again, and it says he's going to be blessed twofold for everything that he had. And so he gets, I don't remember what the actual numbers were, but you know, say he had 5,000 sheep, then he was going to have 10,000 sheep. And if he had 500 oxen, he was going to have 1,000 oxen. And he gets seven sons and three daughters. So he, he doesn't get 20 kids. He doesn't get twofold. He gets 10 more kids. Because the first 10 kids he had, although they were taken from him there at the beginning, he's going to see him again in heaven. And so when he gets to heaven, now he will have the twofold blessing. He'll have 20. And, and so I, I think there are things that we don't think about in the spiritual realm, things in heaven beyond us, because doggone it, we see what we see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're, we're so focused on what's going on here. And so part of Judas's story is the three years that he didn't walk in the close relationship, a saving relationship, and how that impacted him for eternity. Yep, we and, always got to think about that. And and you pointed to a, to a good thing too of of you know I, I, there's a part of us that relates to Judas and 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 that's okay and a good thing. But we need to think about what are what are we doing to not be like Judas? Yes, you know we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fall short. Um, but but to not end in the way that that Judas did. Very very true. Well, my question aside, we did have um, a few people send in questions this week. Actually, we got a lot of questions this week, mm-hmm. uh, which was which was awesome. And we just want to say thank you again for for doing that. You can continue to do that with the Dropbox outside the Worship Center or email us at occpodcast at lewistonocc.org. We really enjoy walking through Scripture with the body. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And it, it helps make sure that, that these midpoints help you connect the dots while also letting you in on, on some of our own wrestling. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we do this and it's great fun. I enjoy hanging out with you and here. I enjoy hanging out with everybody as we do it. It's not just, I mean, it's, as you said, we're trying to engage with the body here. If I stand up and preach 40 minutes, I could have easily preached 80. I mean, the, <laughs> most of these stories are so meaty. There's a ton of things. And so it's fun to, mm-hmm. to spend this time than just digging into a few more things. So we really enjoy it. Yes. Yes, it, it is a lot of fun. It's a blessing for, for me, for sure. Uh, so we, we talked ab- about um, replacing Judas already. Sure. Um, that, that was one of the questions. So another question that came in that, that is an interesting one is uh, they casted lots. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for uh, Rolling the dice. For, are, are you, do you say Matthias? <clears throat> Matthias, yeah. Matthias. I took German, mm-hmm. and so whenever I see it, I see Matthias. Yeah. Uh, but I know that's not the case, but it, that's burned into my mind. No, and, and I've heard some with a hard team, Matthias, as well. But I, for us, I don't know that it matters so much. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but they casted lots. So, I mean, is, is, is it applicable for us to cast lots? And, and why, why did they do that in this scenario? No, and, and again, that's one. I think it's such a neat question, and, and it was one of the things we didn't have a lot of time to address in the sermon, so I'm glad we're getting it here. But you have to put this on the timeline of when these things are happening in the course of history. And, and so in the Old Testament, you see tons of casting lots. I mean, there's probably, I'm, I'm going to guess, and, and I hope I'm not way off, but I, I bet there's probably 40 or 50 references in the Old Testament to mm-hmm. casting lots. In the New Testament, up until this time, and this is the last re- reference that I can remember, and I'm pretty sure it's the last recorded reference of casting lots. But I mean, that, you know, it was something they did. They cast lots or Jesus was crucified for who's going to get his robe. It, it was something they did. And after this, you don't see it anymore. And so you have to say, okay, why did this stop being a practice? And it's because of what we're going to study next week. Yes. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is coming in a way that is brand new and unique. Before, literally, God would place his Holy Spirit on someone. He could also take his Holy Spirit away from someone. David famously prays in the Psalms, and we don't understand it well because of the time we live in, where he says, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And we're like, well, that doesn't even happen, but it did <laughs> back then. And so what's happening, obviously, is this moving day theme. We're going to talk about the day of Pentecost, where from that day forward, now every Christ follower, the moment they profess faith, gets the indwelling Holy Spirit. So there's really no need to cast lots. It's not that you still couldn't use it. I mean, God could work in something like that as well. But literally, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us to guide us into good decision-making. 
We get this discernment. We get these gifts of the spirits. We have patience to wait and see what God is doing. And so there's really no need to cast lots anymore. And so that's why you don't see it anymore. Now, again, the, the hilarity to me of even the proverb that says, you know, the lot is cast into the lap, but the Lord determines what, what's going to come. That just points to God's sovereignty, which is still true. And so if we want to be foolish and go, well, I'm going to flip a coin and, and see which way to go, God can totally make that coin <laughs> land exactly mm-hmm. as he needs it to land. And, and he's in that. We just, you know, because he's the God of miracles and the God of eternity and the God of all and, and creation, we're like, is he really interested in a coin toss? But he he takes care of it somehow, which is amazing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a an interesting question. And honestly, that 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 all was very new to me. <laughs> um, we talked about this a little bit before, so I'm sorry you guys don't get the reaction out of me that I had <laughs> when I heard this, because uh, that had never really dawned on me before. And it, it's interesting that you brought up uh, even that they cast lots... I mean, there's when when Jesus mm-hmm. had died and and they're arguing over who who gets his robe and mm-hmm. they cast lots. Uh, so there's you see it even in rapid succession, yeah. right there. Yeah, uh, and then and no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 and like I say, and and that that clear uh, delineation where there now it doesn't happen anymore. You know, well now there's it's a different uh, dispensation is the word I always use, but now things are going to be viewed differently because of this event that happened. And the event clearly is the day of Pentecost. Yeah, and you had mentioned something when we talked about this about um, um, I'm backing up a little bit, um, but but why why Peter was doing this? And you had mentioned that um, was it a psalm that talks about. He quotes a couple psalms in that passage. He quotes Psalm 69, I think, and 109, if I remember correctly. And, and legitimately, yeah, this is the part of the Scripture being fulfilled. Peter's just leading. He's stepping up at this point in time and saying, hey, while we're here, we, we don't truly know when the Holy Spirit's coming. We just know it's promised, you know? And so there's work for us to do. And, and I think that's that's a still applicable for us today. You know, in that, yes, God's sovereign over all things. His timing is not going to you know, let us down. But in this, we're not supposed to just sit and, and sit on our hands and wait for Jesus to come back because that'll learn you a letter in Scripture. That The church at Thessalonica did that. I mean, Paul wrote First Thessalonians, and then they basically said, well, we'll just sit and wait on it, you know, and he came back and said, no, you guys still need to do stuff. <laughs> you need to engage. And so we're always looking for how we're going to join God where he's at work. That leads us to our vision here at OCC. Yeah. And I think that's what Peter was doing here with these guys. Hey, we're here. We're in Jerusalem. We're waiting on this thing, but scripture has to be fulfilled. And, and again, to me, I think there's a real symmetry to God saying, yeah, do this before the day of Pentecost comes, because this team needs to be complete before I send you out to go make witnesses to the ends of the earth. And and there's there's a lot of wisdom. The reason I bring that up is is there's so much wisdom in in like okay they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Man, how do we hear from God? Yeah. And they had the scriptures, and we have the scriptures. Ding, ding, and ding, so ding, often ding, 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 when we feel yeah. that way, that isn't our reaction. And the wisdom that Peter had in that moment. Yeah. Um, Peter's growth journey and, and is just phenomenal to watch. But it, it, part of it is because he came from so far. He was so impetuous. He was just such a mess. Love him, <laughs> and and then to end up showing you know, these these tremendous signs, and obviously if you read uh, his letter in, in scripture, um, the the growth pattern this guy had was just phenomenal. But yeah, in that he steps up, and and uh, the thing I love the most, and I think I said it in the sermon, I think I remember saying it. The thing I love the most is he went immediately to scripture. So yeah, scripture has to be yep. fulfilled. Here's the actual passages. <laughs> this is what David said. Let's do this. So yes. Okay, so we got all right. Here's a here's a good one. All right, so what does the Bible? So this one is stretches a little bit, but actually it ties really well into this message. And I don't know if that's. I think I think that's where this question comes from. Um, but where what does the Bible say about suicide? Where do these people go who take their own life? Yeah, and that's such a tough question, Wesley. And and because you know, for for somebody to even jot that down, drop it in the box. You got to assume that that's they're they're impacted by that in some way. They have a friend who potentially has committed suicide or has struggled with depression, and so it's a real thing, you know. Um, the the fantastic thing is that there's such hope in there. Uh, nowhere that I can see in the Bible would it say, "Well, suicide would mean that you don't get to go to heaven." That's just not the way the Scripture reads. I mean, real famously, John three eighteen is is. 
sometimes we forget because it comes after John three sixteen, and, and, you know, that really does wrap everything up kind of in that one verse. But, um, I don't know that I have it memorized completely, but John three eighteen is basically, Hey, you're not going to be condemned because if you've placed your faith in Christ, then you're promised no condemnation. And so in that, it's not like we're going to do something that's going to erase the fact that we've already professed faith. Now, for someone who does feel like that that's the the course that they're supposed to take, I mean, that person is, is normally suffering with, there was a huge loss, there's a depression. Of course, there's levels of depression, there's clinical depression. There's things that people end up with where they think, well, that's going to be the best thing. And and obviously, you pray for those people to find help and talk with people and, and, and walk through those processes. If somebody does commit suicide, I've had, um, I've been touched by that several times with friends or, or normally family of friends. That does not mean that you don't get to go to heaven. It, it certainly does not. Uh, of the cases in Scripture, and there, there are a few. I mean, I can't remember all of them, but I mean, I, I know there's five or six. Saul commits suicide. Saul's armor bearer commits suicide. Um, truly, Samson kind of commits suicide, but he, I don't think he'd be counted because he was trying to wipe out Philistines instead of himself. It just <laughs> happened that that's what he ended up doing. But but of the, of the cases you see in, in there, Judas is the one where clearly it's like, hey, that guy was not a believer. Um, but no, that for, for somebody who, who has had a family member who has perhaps taken their own life or whatever, and they're thinking, well, that means they're designated for hell. No, that doesn't mean that whatsoever. Scripture would not support that. If they've placed faith, then they are going to wind up in heaven for eternity. That that part I am confident of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I wish we had I wish we had more time, and uh, even uh, you have more than I do, so I don't want to down credit. But but just the ultimate training to say um, something that would help those that may be struggling in this place. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think there's something that we can, and, and this is something, you know, I've been real blessed to, to have God use me that way and, and counseling with people who start, uh, struggle with depression. There's lots of depression we see in the Bible, honestly. I mean, Solomon, the wisest guy ever, get, gets to a spot where he thinks life is meaningless because literally he says, hey, this isn't going the way I thought it was going to, in my wisdom, you know, and and if you remember a song, he says, you know, vanity of vanities, you know, this doesn't mean anything. And legitimately, it's it's a pretty good case to make. Why would we elevate what we see here on Earth above what we're going to see in eternity? This is not the prize. Mm-hmm. As as good as it might be at times, it's pretty stinky a lot of the times. Um, famously, and I can't remember where uh, Paul ends up in that spot. You know, there's times where Paul is, is in such despair that he's like, "It'd be better if I wasn't here." You know, and th- now those guys don't you know take a step of, of suicide. But the reality is we all kind of struggle sometimes wondering, mm-hmm. is this even worth it, you know? And, and I think we need to, I don't know that I want to say normalize that, but we do have to understand that's, that's common. You know, a lot of people <laughs> struggle in that. And I think we kind of wrongfully think, well, gosh, if I'm a Christ follower, then I should never struggle with depression. And that's just really not true. Um, the, the reality is, uh, and, and again, there's so many depressive levels, but there are things, you know, we're going to lose a loved one or, or we're going to lose a job or, you know, and it would be weird to not struggle with a downtime in that. I mean, that'd be very odd if we didn't. Now, again, as you study through, and this is where I'm not a, a LPC or a, a practicing counselor, just a pastoral counselor, there's clinical depression. I know for sure there's, there's people who it would, it would really benefit them to go talk to a counselor. It would benefit them to have blood work done to, to make sure their chemical levels, their hormonal levels, all that, because they may be medicine they could take that would help them. And, and God could totally be in that. God uses medicine. God uses doctors, all those things. God mm-hmm. uses counselors. And, and so, you know, it, it's just the reality is this world is such a fallen place that suicide is a, a, a thing that people consider as an option. And, and I just wish that they had someone who could lovingly talk them through that and go, that's not the option that you need to consider. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why I say you get a question like that and your heart just hurts for, for the person who would ask it and, and thank the Lord that they did ask it because you know other people are thinking about it. So, Yeah, and, and, and I think, and, and this is something that, that has helped me um, to some degree, and, and honestly, it, it hit me in, in this why we're going to end this way, um, was, was how you finished... Well, he tied up the sermon in comparing Judas and Peter, yeah. um, and that both of them had a betrayal, um, 
Um, I mean, I, I guess you could argue Judas had one betrayal mm-hmm. and Peter had three. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, and I don't, it, none of that, none of that's really, really that important. But when we tell ourselves lies, mm-hmm. um, um, it, it is, it's easy for us to go, well, I did it three times. Yeah. Or I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so, so far, far gone. And I, and it was, it was, it, it struck me and I, I would just like you to finish of talking about, um, again, like what was the difference between Peter and Judas? Well, and that was the thing again, cause I loved walking through the passage and it really lent itself to, to the exegesis of, of what was going on. But in that, that was the takeaway that God was kind of thumping on me. Hey, yes, Judas walked with these guys for that amount of time and he was not a believer and he failed. All those guys failed. We, mm-hmm. we all fail in that. And Peter, as you know, again, I feel like the Holy Spirit was kind of pressing me to, to make the comparison between Peter and Judas, but it's just because Peter's the obvious leader. And he stepped up here, and here's a guy who literally had just finished denying that he knew Jesus three times. You know, and, and after having famously said, you know, all these may leave you, but I'll never leave you, Jesus. And, <laughs> and to say, unless I deny you three times there in the courtyard. And for Jesus to literally be able to, to I use the word reinstate, because that's what it feels like there. You know, Peter denies him three times, and Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Because he's getting him into the spot where he's like, okay, I got something for you to do then. It's not that you're now eliminated from ministry. Now you go and feed my sheep. Now you go and do these things that I'm, I'm going to call you to do. And, and so the difference, obviously, between those two guys is not in how they failed, because they both failed. The difference is not in who they were in, in the pecking order. They were both disciples. They were both in the group. They both had hung out with Jesus. The difference is in how they responded to the failure. Judas did not take his sin to Jesus. If he'd been a, a Christ follower, I really believe that he would have. And he took it instead to the grave. He took it to eternal separation from the Lord. Peter went the other way. By the grace of God, Peter said, I'm coming back. And, and that couldn't have been easy. And, and obviously, as you, know, you look at Peter's life and, and just the, the boldness and the impulsiveness, and, and, but he was considered the leader. The other guys considered him the leader. And to, to publicly fail like that and then to come back. And, and I just I can't get over what that picture would look like him out on the boat and realizing it's Jesus on the shore and just with the long robes and everything, just throwing himself in the water and going, I got to get there. I got to get there right now. Yeah, that gets me. Mm-hmm. I get goosebumps yeah, every time yeah. thinking about that. And, and so that to me is the picture. It, it, and, and what does Jesus do? He, he forgives him. And he says, no, you're my guy. And, and yes, there's consequences every time we're disobedient. But here's what I want you to do. You're going to go and feed my sheep. You're going to go and teach the Bible. You're going to go and be a witness to the ends of the earth. And Peter did it. And again, like I said, all you got to do is read the letters from Peter in, in the Bible and, and compare and contrast them to who he was in the gospel accounts. And that's a dude who grew enormously. <laughs> that's a guy who mm-hmm. really got it and lived a changed life. And so, you know, the, the obvious, you know, I just, I, I loved the hope that at the end of the passage, because it was, if somebody was here at the service and they're not a Christ follower, today is the day to run to Jesus and say, hey, I, I, I'm sorry for living this life apart from you. I want to profess faith in you. And that person saved that moment. But for so many of us, church designed for believers, for many of us, we're sitting there going, well, I've done this thing X number of times. Or I've struggled with this sin that many times. And, and, and I'm just, there's no hope for me. There is hope. There's always hope. As long as we draw breath, there's hope. We run to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me this thing. And he will. And I I just, I mean, there's nothing else like that. I mean, there's no other religion like that. There's no other drug like that. There, there's no other anything like that that gives you that kind of hope. Mm-hmm. And and that's the thing that I just, man, I hope and pray people realize that. Because that is life-giving beyond this life. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> And I, and I, if you need to re-listen to that, re-listen to that, because <laughs> I mean, I, there, there's, there's so much truth there for sure. It's oh, good uh, stuff. God's I mean, good. God is so good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, let's, let's look ahead to next week, shall we? Next week is super exciting and, uh, and I do feel bad and this is just, uh, the, the way life works in this, it's my wife's birthday and I'm very, very excited about that. So I'm not going to be. Uh, preaching. She's and, turning 30. Yeah, she is turning 30 in, in a couple. And uh, <laughs> so, but it's a, it, I'll just say it's a milestone birthday for her and leave it at that. But, but in that, I'm very excited and I want to be able to celebrate a little bit with my wife. And so 
while I really uh, was excited about this passage coming up, it truly is where we got this moving day theme, the day of Pentecost. Uh, my buddy Brenton is going to preach next week, and he was uh, quite thankful, and we talked through uh, making sure we are kind of on the same page where the text is going. But neat, neat passage. Uh, literally lots to talk about with the, the, the indwelling, moving Holy Spirit, and then also just the ramifications of that. You know, people speaking in languages that others... You know, that they didn't know that others could understand. And, and there's just some crazy stuff going on in there. Uh, he'll do fantastic. God's good. Holy Spirit will work in that. Um, but Brenton will, will be teaching that. And, and I'm a little sad, but mm-hmm. very excited. Yeah. But, but very excited for you. You have a theme about handing <laughs> handing off the yeah. the high parts of the story. You f- well, didn't finish out Luke and that, that, coming on the end of Luke, where I, I, I preached this through two and a quarter years of Luke, and then gave the last part with all the great stuff. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not bitter. What yeah. I want you to understand is I'm not bitter. I'm, I'll get another chance uh, to preach that one of these days. But but this passage is going to be very very exciting. And again, it's kind of where we get this theme and this moving day theme will kind of carry us to Easter, and then we'll kind of pick up. There's some sub-themes in, in the book of Acts, and, and a lot of it obviously related to which disciple you're, which, which of the Acts of the Apostles you're viewing at the time. So, But this one will carry us to Easter, and, and hearing it next week is going to be a great reminder of the the boom, the dunamis that we have, that indwelling spirit, because it, it is. It, it is there, there's no other event in church history kind of like this one we're going to talk about next week. Yep. yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How would how would you suggest that that uh, we prepare and and be praying as we head into this message? The, the way to pray, I think, and, and again, I, well, I'll tell you this: the the way that I'm praying about this coming up is that there's a, a awakening to us understanding how different it is for us than it was for even the disciples during the gospel accounts that we read, because that's the thing to me, and and I, I say this so often, but. It, uh, just the way I, I think, I always try and picture, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's going on in this story, because it makes it more real to me than just reading on a page. There, there are people who read books, and there are people who watch movies, and some people go, well, the movie's never going to be as good as the book. Well, no, it doesn't have to be as good. It just has to give you a picture that you can kind of place yourself in, and that helps sometimes. And so in this, the, the account that I think of over and over again is that Jesus is hanging with his guys. He's with the disciples. They're doing ministry. And and that looked even beyond probably what we're thinking. They were eating meals together. They were having conversations together. They were friends, right? And Jesus would be like, okay, I got to peace out because I'm going to go pray to my dad. And he'll leave, Like, and, and sometimes he leaves in the middle of the night to go pray, and the disciples freak out because <laughs> they're like, uh, uh, where'd Jesus go? You know, and, and he tells them, Hey, <laughs> you're going to have to get ready for this because there's going to be a time I'm not going to be with you. And it, I remember this, he says in John 14, and that's going to be better for you because you won't have to freak out then when I'm not there. You'll have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And he's pointing to this thing that obviously he knows as God, he knows what's going to come. None of those guys can get it. None of those guys grasp it. And of course, what we're going to see play out then is these guys, and again, Peter is your example probably, is the, the, the best example. Peter, who just denied Jesus three times, now gets the power of the Holy Spirit, and here in the next couple chapters, we're going to see him preaching boldly and going, I don't care, throw me in jail, ain't no big deal. You know? And you're like, well, something happened to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> right? And we know what it is. We have the, the timeline of history to see it was this dunamis, it was this power of the Holy Spirit. So that changes everything. That changes how you and I live today. That changes how you and I witness today. These guys were there, and so their life change is incredible. But we get to benefit from that. So, so that's the prayer. Pray to, for the for the recognition. Pray for the thankfulness that we didn't have to go through that in-between time. We literally, the second we profess faith, now we have that Holy Spirit. That's a blessing. That's mm-hmm. a huge, huge blessing. Yeah, and it's big. Yes. Well, that's, that's all the time we have for, for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's Midpoint. And be sure to join us in services uh, Sunday at 9 and at 10.30 a.m., as well as Monday night at 7 p.m. If you miss the Sunday services or you work in a way that you can't can't join us on the weekend, uh, we do the same thing again on Monday. We love our Monday night, folks. Yes. It's a good time. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we hope to see you all very soon. It, it, it really is a joy for us. And be well and know that you were loved by God and the Orchard's Community Church. Amen. Love you guys. God bless.